Okay, it's actually seemed to slow down a little bit. So we have about 20 people here. So I think we're good to get started. Um, the session, just to let everyone know, is being recorded so that we can post this up later on our website so that um, if you wanted to rewatch it or share it with someone that you know, uh, it'll be up there and I believe on our YouTube channel as well. So uh, it'll be available for everybody. Um, so, so welcome. Um, my name is Kyle. I'm the Translational Research Associate with WeSpark. Um, and I'm also the local REDCap administrator. And today is the first session in a uh, series of workshops that we're, we're hoping to hold uh, regarding REDCap, um, which is the Re Research Electronic Data Capture Tool um, that we are now providing for uh, our WeSpark researchers and members. So for your best experience, um, just turn off your video and mute your mic. If you have any questions, you can use the chat. I can't see them right now, but after um, I stop sharing my screen, I can I can get that. We have, I think, two Q&A sessions planned, um, one before uh, we go into the tour of REDCap and one after, and you'll see that on the agenda. Um, if there is anything urgent that you see um, at the time, just raise your hand in the chat, and I think Karen and Adrienne are on. They'll, they'll give me a hand uh, in identifying um, people asking those urgent questions. And as always, if you ever have any questions about REDCap or concerns or ideas and need a consultation, you can always email me directly at kyle.logo at uwindsor.ca. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, so this is the first in the series of workshops that we're going to be holding, um, Intro to REDCap. And these are the other three that we have planned. Um, the second one would be the data import, export, and report building. So basically how to get old legacy data into REDCap if you have some, some old databases, and then how to get it out of REDCap once it's in there in a, in a format that you know can easily plug into statistical analysis software. And also the report building functions within REDCap we'll be going over. Um, the next one after that is project management, where we'll highlight user roles and how you can kind of automate workflows um, amongst your study staff on your REDCap project. Um, the survey module will be the fourth one, which I think a lot of you might be very interested in. Um, we have some users on today who have been using it quite extensively so far, so I, I think it's been very helpful for them. The agenda today, we're going to go over the history of REDCap. Um, we're going to discuss the ideal research data lifecycle, kind of introduce you to uh, what REDCap actually is, what it can be used for, why it might be helpful for you, and then we'll follow that up um, with a live demonstration and a tour of our U Windsor uh, WeSpark Health uh, REDCap instance. So I sent out a survey um, on Wednesday. So thank you for those who responded. And it was just two simple questions. And the first of which was, how familiar are you, uh, how familiar are you with REDCap? Um, and you can see some, some, some of the responses here. Uh, we have a few people. The first one is, I have no idea what REDCap is. So I, I'm happy for those who answered that and are here today. So because hopefully I, I'll be able to enlighten you. Um, the second was, I've, I've heard of REDCap, but I haven't used it. So again, I hopefully will be of, of assistance today. And then there are some people on the line uh, who have some limited experience with REDCap, whether they've used it at a prior institution, or maybe they're some of the early adopters here at U Windsor, uh, sorry, with WeSpark Health. Um, and nobody identified that they're, they're experts. Um, so that's good, because that means uh, I'll, I'll keep my job for now. So that's great. Um, what are you hoping REDCap can help you with? So it seems pretty unanimous. People are looking for data collection, data management uh, assistant tools. And there's some people on the line who want to see if REDCap can help with some of their operations slash administrations forms, intake uh, request forms, and things like that, which um, we'll be showing you later that REDCap is rather uh, adept at doing. Uh, so how did this start? Um, wh why did we get REDCap? You know, what, what is going on in the kind of research landscape that is um, pushing forward kind of open data collaborative research data management uh, software? Um, and this kind of stems from here in Canada, the, the tri agencies putting forth a research data management policy. I believe they submitted it in 2018. Um, and it was actually supposed to be rolling out uh, last year, um, but COVID had delayed it. And I think I actually heard this week that it might be their first draft um, might be pushed out within a month. So you might hear something um, soon about this, but the kind of uh, idea of what the tri-agency is requiring is that 
any publicly funded research data should be responsibly managed and available for reuse, reuse by others uh, as appropriate. So um, typically people have been um, you know, collecting research data and not knowing what to do with it after the fact. And then we have people who might be producing redundant studies when there's someone who actually has collected very similar data, but it was just not in a format that it was easily shareable. So as a part of this data uh, management policy, the TRI agency is now requiring or, or soon to be requiring individuals who are applying for TRI Council funding to produce data management plans, um, which will describe kind of the four aspects of what, you know, what they plan on doing with their data. So how will they be collecting their data? Um, if there's an existing data set, how those existing data sets will be linked and how do you plan on putting new data in there, how you're going to share that data with collaborators or make it available to the public because they are advocating for this kind of big open data landscape, and where will it be stored, um, which is a, a big uh, important factor uh, because a lot of people are storing uh, data, you know, on their own personal drives or in, in ways where it can't easily be accessed or audited, um, which, you know, can lead to data breaches or, you know, improper handling of the data. So these data management plans are ways researchers can explain to these funding agencies um, how they're going to be responsible stewards of data. And this is extremely important in healthcare research where we're of, often dealing with um, sensitive data from patients um, in, in clinical research studies. Um, so the ideal research data life cycle is what you see here. You, you kind of plan uh, your project and what you're going to do with your data. You create uh, your databases, you, you process it by getting that data in, you pull it out and analyze it to test your hypotheses and, and try to figure out what you're doing. And you go on to the uh, next part of the life cycle, which is preserving the data, sharing it, reusing it in the future. But unfortunately, what often happens is what you see here. Um, and, you know, this could be done for a variety of reasons. Of, oftentimes, it's just the researchers don't have the tools available to proceed to those next steps of preserving and sharing and reusing data. So they often get to the point of analysis, they pull their data out, and they they find whatever you know they're looking for. And unfortunately, sometimes they don't find it. Um, and it kind of ends there. And then they just have these you know huge uh, Excel files or Microsoft Access files containing lots of, you know, good data that other researchers would love to use, um, but it, it kind of sits there in the silo. So um, it, it's important that we develop tools that allow researchers to not only, you know, collect data efficiently, but share it with others. Uh, so I joined WeSpark in 2019, um, and I come from a, a, a clinical research background where I was introduced in REDCap in 2016 as a tool and became very familiar with it. And when I, I came to Windsor and I started working with WeSpark and some of our researchers and our clinician researchers, I noticed that there didn't seem to be a unanimous kind of research data management tool available to them. A lot of times, uh, databases um, and data were, were sent to collaborators at the university, at the college, at the hospital, over email, um, you know, which could lead to a host of issues, uh, including data breaches. You know, sometimes you don't get uh, the cleanest data. Um, the validation is poor on it, so it's really difficult to do anything with it, and you have to do a lot of kind of morphing of that data to make it usable or to plug it into your analysis software. Um, so I conducted an environmental scan uh, with WeSpark to see kind of what was going on. And um, I, I looked around and I found that there wasn't kind of a sole um, tool that they could use. And I had actually heard from some of our clinicians who have heard of REDCap. And at the time, you know, luckily I was quite familiar with it. And they said, you know, yeah, we would love to have REDCap available to us. So um, at that time, we decided to pursue a licensing agreement with Vanderbilt University, who created the, the creators of REDCap. And in July of 2020, we actually uh, got our license executed and our first instance of REDCap uh, uploaded. Um, so some of you might be wondering about all this REDCap talk. What actually is REDCap? So REDCap is a PHIPAA or FIPA. Yeah, there's lots of ways of saying this, but basically um, it, it is compliant with personal health information uh, legislation in terms of collecting patient data. 
Uh, it's a secure web application that allows researchers to collect, store, and analyze data from anywhere in the world um, in one centralized repository. And you can see um, a little screenshot here of, of REDCap, which is a little teaser because we'll be getting in and seeing a lot more in just a little while. Um, so REDCap is, is vastly popular. Um, this, this is one of the most recent updates from projectredcap.org where they post their stats. The REDCap consortium has over 3,802 active partners in over 132 countries. Uh, there's been over 800,000 projects created from over a million users um, and lots of journals, uh, article citations uh, containing REDCap. And you can see from the red dots here, um, you know, they're, they're quite, it's used all over the world just because of the, you know, the ease of access by, all you need is an internet uh, uh, connection and you can get onto REDCap. Uh, somewhere that hits a little closer to home, these are some of our fellow Ontario institutions using REDCap. Uh, it's quite an extensive list, so I apologize if it's, it's hard on the eyes, but you can see probably some of these institutions that uh, you're probably very familiar with. Um, there, there's quite a few big names on here, uh, and, and they all use REDCap in some capacity. So why do we want to use REDCap? So data standards, um, a, a big issue when you're trying to share data with your collaborators is that it's not shared in kind of a meaningful way. You just send them their data uh, and you could have coded it in one particular way and they don't really understand how it, it, it looks on their end and how to plug it into their statistical analysis software. So within REDCap, you can set validation on your fields and uh, on your data so that it stays consistent in a consistent format that allows it to be easily shared. Uh, uh, FIPA compliant, um, so th that's uh, another big bonus for clinical research. REDCap is approved for the storage of personal health uh, information when appropriate. Um, we'll be going in on this a little more in, in further uh, workshops, but uh, it, once at the end of this, if you decide to pursue a REDCap account, um, once you read our terms of use, you, you'll see how we deal with uh, personal health information with this particular instance of WeSparks uh, REDCap. Um, easy data sharing. So this is the big one. Um, when we did that environmental scan, we were hearing from our researchers that there's just not an easy way to get my data to who I want it to go to. Um, and with REDCap, we can solve that. Uh, you can create a project and uh, you can add anybody with a REDCap project on that particular instance to your project. And you can assign them particular rights as to what they can do and what they can't do. So if you're simply just trying to share with somebody at a different institution, you would get them a REDCap account, sponsor them. Um, I would then create it. You can add them to your project and you can set their rights up so that they can do whatever they want, which is oftentimes just downloading data. Um, whereas it, this reduces the need for kind of redundant and often insecure emails. Uh, customizable. So REDCap primarily was developed as a clinical research tool to uh, alleviate the financial burden of uh, clinical trials. It's extremely expensive to produce a clinical trial nowadays, and the big kind of pharma companies who are able to do so pay a lot of money for clinical data management software. Um, REDCap is kind of a solution for those who maybe don't have access to those sorts of resources or working in an academic center because um, uh, it's, it's free. It's free to any nonprofit and it's customizable in the sense that you don't actually have to just use it for clinical research. While it was created for clinical research, um, it has a lot of applicability across um, other types of research and operations and administrations, uh, forms, intake requests, et cetera. And you'll be seeing you know, how customizable uh, we can make REDCap during our live tour. Um, the REDCap API. So the very cool thing about REDCap is that in a sense, it's not necessarily open, um, open code or open software, um, but once you have the licensing agreement and you have your instance of REDCap set up, there's nothing stopping you from modifying REDCap and you know adding modifications to make your project do something that you want it to do. Um, it's very customizable, and if you have the skill set, um, you can interact with REDCap's API and push and pull data from anywhere on the web. And, it, and this can be very useful for automating workflows, which I think 
if I have to say the number one thing about REDCap besides being able to share data easily, um, it's its ability to automate workflows and reduce a lot of workload on study teams, which is really good for researchers um, who don't have access to you know millions and millions of dollars of funding. Uh, so the community of REDCap is how it's supported. This is much different than a lot of other clinical data management software or, or other software, um, you know, for data collection such as Qualtrics, where, you know, you have a company in a 24/7 hotline that you can call them and they can they can assist you in that way. Uh, REDCap is entirely community supported. So at the Weispark Health Institute level, it's it's me currently and our IT team for the stuff on the back end. Um, but if I have any questions, I typically go into the REDCap consortium online and post on the forums and get support that way. And, and the good thing about that is that it'll work if everybody is, you know, re using REDCap and REDCap's fairly active, which is very much the case. Uh, you can see it's used at a bunch of institutions. Actually, these numbers might be a little different from the ones. I think these ones are more updated. So uh, REDCap usage is only going up. And the user support that you get on the, the consortium is, is very quick and responsive. And Vanderbilt themselves um, are very helpful in terms of helping out with uh, REDCap. And I'll explain a little bit later during a live tour how we've actually collaborated with Vanderbilt on a, a recent project. Um, used by many of our partners. So this allows for easier collaboration because if you have a partner at another institution who's familiar with REDCap, and then you become familiar with REDCap, it makes it that much easier to share databases, uh, give data to each other, because you kind of have an inherent understanding of what it's supposed to look like. And they can actually send you code of a carbon copy of their database if you wanted to host it on your local instance, and et cetera. So it's, it's much easier to collaborate across institutions and sometimes across departments within institutions can be very uh, helpful. Um, so the big one, if you are pursuing tri-agency funding, um, REDCap will satisfy pretty much all you need to say in terms of your data management plan. And we're working currently with the Windsor RAB and the Letty Library right now, um, who are uh, Letty's kind of tasked with leading the charge of this tri-agency data management plan uh, push um, where it's supposed to be gaining institutional support. Um, we're going to be providing materials on our website that'll give you all the, the kind of boilerplate language and tools that you need to plug into your grant uh, data management plan section um, so that you can say, hey, I'm using REDCap and this is what REDCap's all about so that your uh, funding agencies will see that and be very happy with you. Um, Multi-site projects. So very cool thing about REDCap, we won't go into it too much today, but you can set up data access groups where um, you could have you know, as many sites as you want on a project um, and you can set it up in such a way that they're only able to access the data from their project. But if you're the host site, you can see everything. So it's it's really kind of nice in, in that way. Um, data sharing is important. You can see uh, WeSpark Health Institute is on here with all of our partners. And um, in order to advance research and particular health research in our local scene, we need to be able to effectively uh, collaborate and communicate with our partners uh, and across them. And uh, we believe that REDCap um, and giving REDCap accounts to uh, individuals at our institutions will allow them to share data easily and build out more robust research projects. Uh, data sharing is also extremely important in terms of future implications. And if you're interested in kind of big data and if you follow that sort of thing, um, you've probably read a lot of articles about how artificial intelligence is improving, you know, the ways that we treat illness. And there's there's two articles here that you can see one from Nature, how it's improving cancer diagnostics and one where it's being used to um, help in mental health and, um, you know, AI uses these incredibly large data sets to run uh, analysis and, and, and teach itself, you know, how can we improve in terms of treatment of certain diseases. And the way that they get that data is from people collecting the data and making it available. So by having your data kind of organized efficiently in REDCap and formatted in a way that it can be easily shared, uh, you can often contribute to putting these data out into these large data repositories that lead to these, um, uh, you know, uh, pushing and, and 
uh, filling these AI programs and, and helping them learn through machine learning. So there's lots of stuff, cool stuff that you can do with your data set after you've done your analysis that I think a lot of people don't uh, necessarily think about right now, but there's a big push for it currently um, going into the future. Uh, so how does RedCap work? So RedCap is not uh, a software in the sense that you download an app on your computer and you open it similar to uh, like Outlook or some other uh, programs. It's a web application. You have to have an active internet connection to get to it. There is offline versions of it if you're in a, sp a space where you don't have great internet connection. Uh, we won't get into that too much uh, now, but it is possible. Um, there is a physical server located at the University of Windsor where everything that's entered into REDCap goes on to. Um, and our IT team takes care of that and they're the ones who, able, or who are able to access it physically. Uh, what can REDCap be used for? So uh, realistically, it can be used for what often whatever you think you think it can be used for. Um, but these are some four big ones that we think are going to be helpful for our researchers here in Windsor. Essex. Uh, you have a clinical research project, multi-site research projects. We've found it already that we've been able to use it for a lot of administration operations things, and um, it's it's adept at um, producing randomized controlled trials and and doing that in a way where it's affordable and it can host them. And there's a randomization module on RedCap that takes care of all that stuff with you and. We'll get into that in the future, but these are kind of the big four that we can see it being used for. Um, REDCap on the go. So REDCap is continuously evolving and there's been in recent years some additions to it from the Vanderbilt team um, to allow you to collect data um, from mobile devices. And there's two listed here that differ kind of slightly. So the Red, REDCap mobile app is an application that you can download on the uh, Google Play or Apple Store that allows you to collect data from uh, mobile devices, iPads, et cetera. Um, and it's mostly meant for collecting data um, in kind of remote areas or areas that you don't have great internet connection that you won't be able to um, connect to REDCap. And you collect this data in the mobile app. And once you do have REDCap, sorry, once you do have an internet connection, um, you simply sync your REDCap mobile app project with your one that's in base REDCap, and it'll plug in all the data for you. Um, MyCap is a, a very recent development. Um, MyCap has uh, been created by Vanderbilt to collect patient reported outcomes, um, in particular for clinical research studies or clinical trials. So it also is an app that you can download on your phone um, and individuals will be provided a QR code, which they scan. And this allows them to connect their MyCap app to the researcher's REDCap project. And in the app, the researcher can assign a various amount of tasks um, related to you know, what they're looking for. We can see this, a, a good example is, um, you know, if you're following up a patient post-surgery and you wanted to ask them some questions about how they're feeling, or if you wanted a diary or something like that, um, the patient would get a prompt to their phone, they would answer it, and that goes right into REDCap. And there's also a messaging center on there that will allow the researcher to stay in contact by sending secure direct messages to them. So two cool ways that you can use REDCap outside of your web browser. Uh, and I think, again, one of the big strengths of REDCap is user-created custom solutions. So what you're seeing on the screen here in front of you is the REDCap repo, um, which is the repository of external modules. So REDCap users from around the world um, often create custom solutions um, by modifying REDCap code or adding essentially plugins to their REDCap that give REDCap increased functionality that uh, base REDCap doesn't have. And the external module repository is just a collection of those that people have submitted and uploaded. So uh, they've created some sort of cool tool and they want to share it with the world. Um, so there, there's several um, really cool ways of modifying REDCap to increase its functionality. And much of those can be found on the REDCap repo. And if you were someone who was you know, ever so inclined to um, create your own external module, um, you could submit that to the REDCap repo and, and someone from across the world might be able to use it in a meaningful way. So it's really cool in that way because uh, we've already actually had several instances where I've, I've used external modules to help a project in one way or another. 
Um, so that's, that's a brief introduction to REDCap. And now we're going to get into the tour portion of it. Um, but before um, we begin, we'll do a quick Q&A. Um, I don't think I can stop sharing my screen now. Oh. Um, does anybody have any questions? Are there any questions in the chat? Let's see here. No, nothing yet. OK, saving the questions for last. That's that's always good. Um, so let me share my screen again. Oh, did I hear something? I can read you the questions, Kyle. So yeah, are the that'd dates be helpful. Are the dates for other red cap workshops posted yet? Uh, the dates aren't posted yet. Um, we're we're still trying to see kind of um, what user uptake is like and what kind of projects are being held. And as soon as we see kind of you know where that's at, I, I might see you know what workshop might be more relevant. Um, so there's not they're not up just yet, but keep an eye out for them. Okay, another question for my cap. Can you disable direct messaging so patients can't message you if you don't want them to? Um, I'm not sure about that. So my cap is in kind of a beta phase right now. So we'll, we'll, I'll have to look into that. But as of right now in base uh, my cap, uh, I don't believe there is a way to disable messaging. Um, but again, uh, it's in beta and it was only created uh, about last year. And I've been working kind of hand in hand with the lead developer at Vanderbilt. So this is actually something that might already be on his docket. Um, so I will I will find that out for you. But as of right now, I'm, I'm going to take a shot in the dark. I think I don't think you can disable it. You could ignore those messages, but I mean, that's that's probably not going to be the greatest thing. Um, um, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, if you start using MyCap for patients midway, then does that have to be updated in the approved research protocol? Uh, that's a good question. I, I'm i not uh, a member of the REB, so I, I can't definitively say. So I would say it, it's probably best to con consult with your REB. I think anytime you make any sort of changes in terms of data collection tools, uh, it's always good to submit an amendment to the REB because um, they'll want to know hey, you know, what's this new thing? This is not what you said that you were initially going to use to collect it. Even though it is technically REDCap, um, I would still consult with the REB to see what they think about it because it's it's an external module. It's secure and it's safe, but it is just a bit different probably than what you submitted initially. Those are all the questions, Kyle. Okay, great. Uh, so this is REDCap. Uh, so welcome welcome to REDCap, everyone. Um, this is the, the URL up here. Um, my screen is sharing correctly, right? Yep, we can see it. Okay, cool. Um, so all you would have to do is uh, get an account created and you can request one on our website. I'll make sure in our post survey that I send out that link if you are interested in creating an account. Um, it's absolutely free and there's, there's no strings attached. Um, and you would simply go to this page and enter your details and log in. And this is kind of the main dashboard of REDCap um, that you can see here. So all of your projects will be listed in this section here. Um, I have quite a few on the go. Yours will probably look a little bit different. Um, and we're going to be looking at some template projects that show REDCap's uh, function and kind of usability. But before we do that, I just want to highlight this top bar here. Um, so new project is what you would select to create um, these projects down here. Um, and the big thing for new users will be to access these training videos. I think it's super important. There's about, I think I tallied it up, about two to three hours worth of videos in here. Um, but they'll really give you, you know, get you ahead of the curve in terms of using REDCap. And I, I can't recommend them enough. Um, you know, these sessions that I'm offering are going to be covering a lot of stuff um, that are a little bit more advanced than in here. So it's really important to build up a foundation of, you know, what can you use REDCap for, um, how to use it, et cetera. And these training videos do a really good job of that. And there's also a lot of materials just across the web. If you just Google REDCap training materials, you'll find some. Um, so there's going to be no shortage of, of places to go um, when you need to learn about REDCap uh, for our WeSpec Health instance. 
Um, so I'm going to get into an actual project now. Um, and we'll go into this basic demography example. So um, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on on the screen um, while I'm going through this. Um, don't worry about it too much. Um, we're just going to break it down the kind of the essentials of what you need to know um, when you get into a project. So uh, you have your main menu on this side of the screen here. Uh, this is kind of how you're going to go in and out and customize and adapt your project. Um, when you create a project and you want to collect data, you need to create an instrument. And you can do that in our project designer or the online designer, it's called. Um, and you can see here that I've created for this basic demography uh, project uh, just two, two instruments, right? I've created a basic demography form and blood lab results. And if we go in, you can see what I've created. These are called fields within REDCap. And these are where you actually are going to be entering your data into. And you can customize these fields to do kind of whatever you like um, amongst the, the given selections. So this one is just a text box where I'm asking uh, to enter the person's date of birth. I've set up some validation on it so that the person can only enter it in a certain format. Um, but there's a variety of different things that you can go through here. And you'll see these in the video as well. Uh, there's calculated fields, multiple choice, yes, no, you can put signatures, uh, lots of cool things that you can do. And, and once you create those instruments in your project and you're ready to start collecting some data, you're going to add records to your project. And you can do that in this add edit record section. In this section, this is where you're actually going to be entering study data for your participants, whether it's live through REDCap or whether you've collected it on per paper and pencil and now are data entering it to get it into your database. So if you wanted to add a new person or a new entry to your project, you would select add new record. Um, this project is just set to auto number, but you can customize the names of uh, each record. So if you wanted to do participant 0001 or whatever your study ID is, that'll be synonymous in REDCap to your record ID. So record and study ID or study participant, uh, they're all synonymous within REDCap. And let's say I have Joe Smith who's coming in or participant 01 who's coming in and I'm gonna enter his data. Here's that basic demography form that I had set up where I can select. Today he came in, um, Joe Smith is zero uh, years of age. So maybe actually we'll, we'll select something a little bit further back. Uh, so Joe's 96 now. Um, and then you can see there's just a, a series of questions that are very typical of a of paper and pencil form, but now they're set up in a way um, that they're uh, within REDCap in this online form. And this is a quick one that you can see that uh, you can actually implement some calculations to save yourself from doing uh, these by hand and kind of increasing efficiency within your project. So uh, I'm really bad with height and centimeters and this stuff. I don't know, 200? No, we'll do 10,000. Oh, so there we go. Um, so apparently I've implemented some validation on this one where um, you can't go outside of the suggested range. So that's a great example. Um, and I promise I didn't do that on purpose. Uh, this is a great example of how REDCap can prevent people from doing data entry errors, which is very common with paper forms, right? Because there's no way of stopping someone from entering a value that you don't want. So for this one, I've decided 130 to 215 is the amount. So we'll say the person's 215 and we'll say weight is 50 kilograms. And this person has a BMI of 10.8. Um, so uh, that probably isn't good for 96, but I digress. Um, so that's a very kind of uh, rudimentary introduction to REDCap and how you can use it to uh, collect and store data. And after you've done this for several people, you can actually get a very good overarching view of the status of your data entry in the record status dashboard. Um, we'll save the changes and leave. So in this project, we've had two entries. For the first person, I've entered the data and I decided that this data is good and it's complete. And I set it as such, so it shows up as green and good to go. Um, in terms of the second person, for whatever reason, that was set as incomplete, so there might be an incomplete result there. And you can uh, tinker around with these to 
set it up in a way that it works with your workflow. But the basics is uh, complete if the record is complete, incomplete or unverified if you have some sort of uh, data entry um, system going on. Um, we also have a project here, very similar, how you could use it potentially for a tissue biobank or uh, something like that if you were a fresh tissue researcher. Um, we've created some tools in here where you can you know, track the IDs for shipping, the date of birth, all the facility name, et cetera, and um, plug that in for each individual record. Um, so, so that's really cool when you're trying to set up an organized way to track um, data. Uh, REDCap is really good for longitudinal process, uh, or longitudinal projects, sorry. Um, so you can enable uh, REDCap to track and uh, do collection of data over time. And in REDCap, these are uh, considered events. So an example, if you have a period in a longitudinal study and you're collecting at time point one, time point two, time point three, um, those time points, you would define them as events. And here's a, a great example. Uh, so if you were doing a drug study or something like that, you might have an enrollment visit, dose one. They might have a follow-up visit after that where they come in. You specify all these events, and then you can designate the instruments that happen within those events at that time. So you don't have to worry about somebody filling out a form um, that they shouldn't. And you're saving you know, a lot of room here with the uh, data and paper by going virtual with REDCap. And you can see here for the enrollment visit, the only instruments enabled are the demographics form, the baseline data that we're collecting. And then at the sub subsequent visits, they have different forms that they're gonna be answering. For example, the patient morale questionnaire is, is asked at dose one and all the way through the final visit, whereas the lab data is only collected at the visits. Um, so really cool ways to set up your project um, and, and collect data longitudinally as well. Um, right here, we have a randomized controlled trial demo. So this one is, is quite uh, advanced, um, but REDCap is very much set up for producing randomized controlled trials for local investigators or investigator initiated trials for people who maybe don't have access to a ton of funding to to get you know metadata rave or oracle uh, solutions um, they can do it themselves by enabling this randomization module uh, and you can see for this project let's say again joe smith comes in and he's a participant in our study we add him to the study um, we fill out his demographics, so they sign the consent today. Um, I should I should say here this first name last name stuff. This is just for the template. We typically uh, will not allow any sort of direct identifiers in REDCap. Uh, in our instance, in particular, we just don't have the capacity to monitor right now. So you'll see more in the terms of use when you apply for your account. But typically, we want people to get rid of any direct identifiers from their projects and just use their study identifier, which will be a unique code that you create and connect to the person outside of REDCap, whether it's an Excel log or a paper log somewhere. But for this one, we'll just say this is participant 01. Uh, again, they were born here. Fill out this information. I apologize, none of this makes sense, but you'll understand when I get to it. So I've, I've filled out their demographics information. I've saved it. And now the person is consented. I have their baseline information that I need um, for the stratified randomization. I go into here. And this is a very simple way of looking at it because there's a lot of stuff going on in the back end with the randomization module. But once you have that set up and you come experienced with it, you assign a field to become your randomized field, and this button will appear. You click randomize, and of course, you'll, you'll get an error the first time. Um, OK, yeah, so I don't think I uploaded the randomization table for this project. But typically, what would happen if, uh, if I did have that in there um, is that it would assign the person to the appropriate uh, group that I had set up in this randomization module. Um, which is here. So yeah, so as you see here, I thought I had some uploaded, but I guess I didn't. But uh, you would upload a randomization module and set it up uh, as you see here. And um, you would be able to randomize participants into your study uh, to whatever group you wanted. 
So, so that's my basic kind of tour of REDCap. Um, those are some demonstration projects, but uh, I've actually been given permission to show you some of the other cool things that we're doing. Um, so right now we're working on um, a pilot project at the University of Windsor of setting up kind of our own homemade uh, screening center. One of our researchers um, who was an Igniting Discovery uh, COVID recipient um, created his, with a collaborator his own COVID test um, outside of uh, public health, but they've tested it and it's as effective as the one used by public health. And we're now setting up a pilot project to see if we can set up a screening center on campus so that um, you know, later on in the year, if not everybody's vaccinated and we're still kind of slow and behind that we could set up our own homemade solution in terms of screening and getting people tested to see if they're positive. And we are using currently REDCap to be kind of the backbone of that and also using MyCap. So how the general workflow is, is that um, we have a project within REDCap where we have, uh, you know, records you can see that we have some test records here. We ask them some questions in REDCap, or sorry, in MyCap, and they can fill it out and answer them accordingly. And MyCap is actually connected to this project. And if you go here, this is the MyCap page where I'm adding my participants and I'm creating tasks. And for this person, you can see here, Kyle Test, what happens is that each person who's added to a MyCap project gets a QR code and they scan it onto their phone. And what our idea is, is that individuals who are participating in this pilot screening project are going to get a QR code sent to them. They're going to scan it with the app on their phone. And then when they show up on the day to screen uh, or, or submit their saliva samples, they'll bring their, their phone and their MyCap app. They'll answer the survey questions that day. They'll enter the barcode for the the saliva sample that they're submitting. And that'll go in, it'll be analyzed by uh, researchers at the university, they'll get a result. We're going to plug that REDCap, are going to plug those results into REDCap and it's actually going to start a chain of events that's going to send automated messages uh, to people letting them know that they're negative. And if we do have positive results, we're going to follow up with them individually. But it's just a great example of how we're using REDCap to organize data and automate workflows. Um, and this is just one creative way we, we found that we could use REDCap in this new MyCap module. But I'm sure there's people that are thinking of other ways that it could be used effectively. Um, I want to go back to REDCap. Um, for WeSpark, we actually use a lot of our request forms through REDCap now. So actually, when you go to request a REDCap account, you're actually doing it, ta-da, through REDCap. And with any REDCap project, you can create a public survey. And when we open this public survey, I'm not sure if it's showing now. I might have set it only to share, to share screen. This is our REDCap account request form. So when someone goes in, um, they enter all of their, their data, they upload their signed copy, and what happens is on the back end here, um, we have a nice record status dashboard where you can see, you know, some of you are actually in here uh, right now, uh, the, the account process of where they get approved. And I've actually set up some notification systems that uh, automate email messages to go to the person saying, hey, your, your REDCap account has been approved. Look out for the creation email shortly. Um, so you can imagine how REDCap can be used for a variety of different requests. Um, we're starting to set up our grant submission um, uh, forms through REDCap. Um, and it just allows you to get a better handle on, you know, what's going on with a particular project because you can access that record status dashboard very easily and see what the status is, which is difficult when you're doing things by email. A lot of us live in our emails and we get, you know, hundreds of emails a day and, and sometimes we miss things and, and drop some balls, which I'm, I'm 100% uh, guilty of. And I found that REDCap can help me organize things in a way where I can go in and quickly see, you know, what's the status of all this stuff? Who submitted something? And there's ways that within a project, you can create alerts and notifications like I have here. Um, Grace Park, I don't know if she's on the call today, but she's one of our collaborators at the Windsor Regional Research Office. Whenever uh, someone makes a REDCap account request from Windsor Regional, 
uh, she actually gets an email as well just to let her know. Um, and you, you can see how this would be helpful if you wanted to have some sort of notification system set up every time someone submitted your form or responded to a survey. And you can also add any one of your collaborators to projects with this user rights uh, module here, which Grace is a, a person on this project. Um, and she can, you know, do whatever you choose to assign. Um, and I know there's some some individuals uh, on the on the call right now who are using REDCap uh, in this kind of format as well. Um, so that's essentially it. That's that's the the very basic to our REDCap. Again, um, the initial learning curve can be a little bit steep, um, but if you do request an account and go through the training videos. The best way to learn is just by tinkering around with it. You can create as many projects as you'd like and do whatever you want with them, as long as you're not entering real data, um, uh, real participant data, uh, you are you know, free to experiment as much as you want. And if you're someone who's so inclined to, you know, if you, you have some coding experience or you know somebody that does and you wanted to do a custom workflow solution like the ones that I mentioned with my cap, um, by all means, uh, shoot me an email and I'd be happy to consult and explore that with you. And, and that goes for anyone who's interested in using REDCap, but maybe doesn't necessarily know how to get started. I'm, I'm more than happy to meet and, and see what I can do to help out. Um, so I think, where are we at here? So that's the tour of REDCap. Um, Here's some helpful resources. So the link here, um, we're actually building out this section of, of REDCap right now on our website. Um, I hope I'm still sharing my, my full screen. Yeah, I should be. Um, so this is where all of our WeSpark REDCap resources are gonna live. So right now you can see we have quite a few sections. Uh, they're not populated just yet, but they will be shortly. Um, we'll have a section on MyCap, the external modules, all the training materials. We'll be uploading our videos and slides here and you'll be able to keep on track of all of our WeSpark policy procedures, how to get people on from external institutions, you know, how to set up a data management plan. All of that stuff will be located on this website um, in due time. Uh, I promise uh, I'll, I'll try to get them up and on here as soon as possible. There's also external resources that you can use. These are two great sites here. I forget um, who this one is. Um, but there, there's a lot of uh, academic institutions across the United States and Canada that offer REDCap training. Whether you can access it or not is a different question, but they often post their slides and their videos up there as well. So there's no shortages of way to, treat, to teach yourself REDCap. Um, and that's it. So now I'm going to go back to my screen here. And uh, if there's any questions, um, Please, please let me know now. Kyle, there aren't any questions yet, but we can uh, keep an eye on it. Um, I know you had some specific questions you wanted from people about uh, what they would like later on. Um, are you going to be sending out a link to let people give you some feedback? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I have a survey I'm going to send out to everybody who's attended today. Um, It'll have the link to a survey where you can ask those questions. And also, if you're interested in, in creating a REDCap account, you'll be able to do that um, with the link provided in there as well from our website. I, I do need to specify, though, that REDCap accounts currently are only uh, available to WeSpark Health Institute members that are working at our partner institutions. Um, if you are an external person, the only way to get access to REDCap is through a sponsor. So if you are uh, working with someone that is under kind of the WeSpark umbrella, that is a researcher, um, you can get REDCap accounts that way, but we don't allow our external researcher, sorry, our external collaborators to create projects. So they only can be invited to projects that their sponsored researcher makes. Um, and from within those projects, they can do whatever the sponsor allows them to do. But unfortunately, we just for the, the licensing agreement, we can't provide access just uh, to base REDCap to external users who aren't affiliated with us. There was a comment here, Kyle, that says, uh, I want to learn more about using the longitudinal, longitudinal module mm -hmm. and mix of electronic consent and paper-based consent forms. Yeah, that's great. So um, 
yeah, for our, the screening project that I mentioned earlier, we're actually using electronic consent forms, and uh, we've we've kind of eliminated paper-based consent forms altogether. Um, REDCap has a really effective uh, electronic consent framework that you can uh, enable on surveys to send out to people, um, and you can add signature fields within the project, so the whole thing ends up being as um, you know it might be REB dependent, but our REB has said that this is allowable and acceptable as a uh, physical signature. And in terms of learning more about that, uh, the longitudinal module videos within the training section will show you how to do that. Um, the the e-consent stuff is a little bit more advanced and there's not training videos on that, but that's something I'm hoping to highlight in the future. Um, and as well, again, you probably can search the web and, and find some stuff out about it. But when you get to e-consent, it, it it depends a lot on what your local uh, board of record, your REB thinks about it. So if they're approving of it, then you have to work with them to see about implementing in a way that uh, is okay for them. There was a follow-up to that saying, if, is there any way to upload consent forms, especially if they require a checkbox for confirming consent? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of different ways of doing it. You can use the data import tool to uh, populate a consent form that you've created from within REDCap or within REDCap itself. Actually, you know what? It's probably helpful if I have REDCap open. Karen, is, is my screen displaying REDCap right now? Yep, we can see your screen, yep. Okay. Um, so again, you could create a consent form and, and plug in that data yourself or within REDCap, there's a file repository. And this section allows you to upload any sort of external files that you'd like into the project. Um, now, these files don't link to particular records, um, but if you just wanted somewhere to store consent forms, you can put them in there. However, I would recommend, because consent forms contain identifying information, that if you are going to have your consent forms within REDCap, you do it in two separate projects. So, for example, my screening project um, that I mentioned, um, you can see here, again, sorry, I got to move all these. Um, I also forgot to mention you can organize your projects and make them colorful and pretty, although you, I wouldn't say mine are too good looking, but um, you can see with the screening project here, I have a screening database and I have a consent form. Um, so I can't go in and show you the records, obviously, because these are people consenting to the project, but in this one, there's a survey that they answer, they become a record in the project, I see who they are, and then in this separate project, without linking any of their identifying information, I add a record uh, to the project. And these are what you're seeing here. These are some of the new additions to the study. These were some of our test ones. These are actual people who are going to be in this screening project where I've assigned them this unique ID, UWS001. So if you are using e-consent or wanting to use consent within REDCap, um, our REB, uh, Suzanne McMurphy, I've discussed with the, this with her at length. She's, she's good with it. Um, but perhaps just maybe consult with me first so I can kind of explain because I don't have those materials up on the website yet. I can walk you through it. Um, but the, the base of it is you should have your consent project separate from where you're going to store data because you can't have any of your data um, being linked to the person's name. That's a good tip, Kyle. Um, there's another question here. Is there a limit on the type of information that can be shared from REDCap using the MyCap? Example, sharing of videos, infographics with study participants. Uh, as of right now, yes. So in my cap, there's no way yet with the direct messaging to uh, send anything but uh, base text. So you can only send text to the person and you can't even format that text in a way. It's basically like um, very rudimentary SMS text messaging where you couldn't send images uh, and stuff like that. Now, with that being said, uh, MyCap is a kind of beta module and it's very recent, so it might be something that they implement in the future. Um, but as of right now, you can't send images or files or anything like that through MyCap. Um, I would probably suggest uh, an alternative to that uh, using just normal REDCap. That's all the questions, Kyle. So if there aren't any more, you can um, wrap it up. That was great, thanks. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so everybody, thank you so much for attending today. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to bring REDCap to our researchers and their staff here um, with WeSpark. And I'm always available again for any sort of consultations if you think REDCap can be useful for you, but you're not necessarily sure how to get it up and, and running. I'm more than happy to meet. 
Um, again, stay tuned to our website. We're going to have resources uh, going up there all the time. And again, uh, referring earlier to the future sessions, um, just keep an eye out for those. When we see kind of milestones being met and people creating projects and getting to those next steps, that's when we'll start releasing kind of, I think, the subsequent sessions that are a little bit more advanced. But um, this session here will be up on our website and our YouTube page for re-watching in case you have to uh, sell red cap to somebody uh, in your in your study team. And uh, I should say, yeah, that's another thing too. We at WeSpark are always looking for new members um, and we have a variety of different ways to uh, become involved in WeSpark. And uh, you can see that on our website and please follow us on social media. We post a lot cooler things than REDCap. Uh, we have a lot of great research going on here in Windsor, Essex, and uh, we really want people to know about it. And you can do, uh, you can learn a lot about it by following us on, on these channels. And I think that's it. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, keep, keep in touch. And again, uh, look out for the, the survey that I'll be sending out very shortly. If you're interested in creating an account, the link will be in there and please fill out the post survey as well so that uh, we can use that to improve our workshops in the future. Thanks so much.